Hey guys, good evening, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our second CARF webinar. Um, we're so excited to have you join us and we're so excited for the content we have tonight. We received tons of questions, so we'll be getting to those after Dr. Donovan does his presentation. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. We're hanging in here at CARF headquarters. Colleen and I are working hard and um, getting ready to ramp up some new things in the coming weeks. Uh, so you can look forward to that. Um, but right now, we're going to um, draw our attention to the uh, seminar and webinar at hand. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Donovan. Uh, some of you may know Jeff um, from uh, previous uh, CARF conferences. Uh, but Dr. Donovan is a U.S. and Canadian-born certified dermatologist specializing exclusively in the diagnosis and treatment of hair loss. He is certified by the American Board of Dermatology and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada. Dr. Donovan currently practices in Whistler, Canada. He is a, a member also of our Medical and Scientific Advisory Board and one of our featured speakers at um, the CARP conferences and the upcoming one in Nashville. So thank you so much, Dr. Donovan. Welcome. Thanks, Jean. I really appreciate this invitation, and uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak uh, and chat with you tonight and to uh, speak with all the listeners about this uh, important and ever-changing subject. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're thrilled to have you. Um, okay, so we know you have a, a webinar and a PowerPoint ready to go. We have it lined up. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand the screen off to you and you can begin your, um, your PowerPoint presentation and uh, we'll start to address some questions at the end. So you have the floor. Sounds great. Well, thank you. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to talk about the basics of scarring alopecia. This is scarring alopecia 101. This is the, the fundamental tools that we all need to understand some of the concepts in scarring alopecia. And what we won't be addressing tonight during this presentation is uh, treatment aspects, but of course I'm looking forward to addressing all sorts of questions at the end. But what we'll be focusing on here is really the, the fundamentals, the, the basic tools that we all need to, to deal with this subject. And Let me see if I can advance this. I don't have any conflicts of interest about anything that I'm going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about all the scarring alopecias collectively. We're going to be talking about lichen plano pilaris, frontal fibrosing alopecia, central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, folliculitis decalvans, dissecting cellulitis, discoid lupus. These are a family of conditions which share some common features. And what I'd like to address tonight is, you know, what are those common features? What, what really is the hallmarks of scarring alopecia? And what do we know about these collectively? And then what do we know about these conditions individually? So let's take a look. How do we go about determining the cause of a scarring alopecia? Well, there's several ways. And as all your listeners know, and as you know, Gene, we, we haven't figured it all out yet, so we have work to do. But traditionally, we can ask patients questions. We can give them surveys in the waiting room as they're waiting to go in to see the doctor, and we can ask them all sorts of questions. And then we can give patients with different diseases the same survey and figure out what's more commonly a response in patients with, let's say, scarring alopecia than someone who comes to see the doctor with a, a common cold. This type of uh, technique has traditionally been a way of, of looking at some of the causes of various diseases, but it really only takes us to, uh, so far. You can imagine that um, if someone sitting in the waiting room is, is repeatedly indicating that they're more likely to take aspirin and they have a certain disease or they're more likely to have a hobby in woodworking or skydiving or gardening, then it can be a tip off that, hey, these might be relevant to the disease, but it usually doesn't work out so clearly. And so patient surveys can help, but they only take us so far. They may be helpful in some scarring alopecias, and many of the listeners are aware of 
surveys about sunscreen use and moisturizer use, which has been uh, quite controversial, but nevertheless caught a lot of attention. And that is that some patients with frontal fibrosing alopecia who are filling out surveys in the waiting room indicate that, hey, they use much more sunscreens and moisturizers than people with other conditions. So there is a role for these kind of survey-based questions. But really, these only take us so far. The other technique that we can use to look at the cause of a disease is to look under the microscope. And this has been a technique for years, as soon as we understood what microscopes were and what they could be used for. And in the early days, when you look under microscopes and you see infectious particles or bacteria, well, this took us certainly a long way with some diseases, but it only takes us so far with scarring alopecia. In fact, when you look at biopsies under the microscope, you can diagnose scarring alopecia. You can determine that, hey, this patient has lichen plano pilaris and this patient has folliculitis decalvans but you don't really get much more information about the cause of the disease. And in fact, the thing that's very surprising to a lot of people, and it's even surprising to me, is that when you take biopsies of lichen plano pilaris or LPP, and you take biopsies of FFA or frontal fibrosing alopecia, and you take biopsies of central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, and you hide the diagnosis and you just give the biopsy to the pathologist, sometimes it can be pretty difficult to distinguish these under the microscope, which is surprising because these conditions are quite different clinically. When I walk into the room, I can sometimes spot lichen plano pilaris. The patient has hair loss in the middle of the scalp. In advanced stages, it looks scarring. Uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia looks different yet. The hair loss is in the front of the scalp. Eyebrows and eyelashes are lost in some cases. Body hair is lost. Central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia is even more different in some ways. It's more common in women with afro-textured hair. And so these are very different conditions, but yet they appear somewhat similar under the microscope. And so the microscope can only take us so far and questionnaires can only take us so far. And so fortunately, we've entered a new era. We've entered a new era where we can look deeper yet. We can look at the proteins inside the cell. We can look at the DNA inside the cell. And there's a whole new field that has evolved. We can uh, talk briefly about genomics, whereby we can look at the genes inside of a cell. We can look at proteomics, where scientists can look at all the thousands and thousands of proteins in a cell and figure out how they differ in this disease compared to this disease. And we can look at lipidomics and we can look at the fats or the lipids inside of a cell. And so nowadays we have incredible tools available to us to ask all sorts of questions. And these are really some of the modern techniques which are going to push this field forward even more. And so these are some really exciting um, techniques that we have now to ask some really uh, challenging questions to figure out the cause of these diseases. So we'll be talking a little bit about some of this today, but there's no doubt about it, uh, we'll all be hearing a lot more about these in the years to come. So a really incredibly exciting time for scarring alopecia research. So. What I would like to do now is introduce all of the listeners to some fundamental vocabulary. And it's not difficult, but we all need to understand a few fundamental terms. And today I'll be talking about five terms that I think we should all know about. Because if we can use these five terms in a sentence, we can describe a whole lot about scarring alopecia. So they're, they're five powerful, powerful words. We're going to talk about the hair shaft. We're going to talk about the sebaceous gland. We're going to talk about stem cells. We're going to talk about the bulge region. And we're going to talk about immune privilege. And if these words aren't familiar to you now, they hopefully will be in about five or 10 minutes from now. And we'll all be experts in these five terms. So let's begin. 
Let's talk about the hair shaft. We all know what hair shafts are because we have hair shafts. The hair shaft shown in this cartoon is orange. And so essentially this would be a cartoon of a patient with orange hair. And so this gentleman in the lower right has about 90,000 orange colored hair follicles, uh, hair shafts on his scalp. And so this is what this diagram is representing. The little blue colored balls at the bottom are the hair matrix. And the goal of the hair matrix is to produce hair shafts. That's what it wants to do. It wants to create these orange colored keratin fibers day in and day out. And this is what a hair follicle is, is all about. The second term I'd like to introduce you to is called the bulge. For years and years, it was realized that the hair follicle is not just a tube, a cylinder with a fiber coming out of it. And if you look at the scalp up close, you would think that there's this area that goes down and this hair comes out of it, but it's not a perfectly cylindrical tube. And what histologists and, and uh, people specializing in anatomy have realized for decades and decades is there's this little bulge two-thirds of the way up the hair follicle. And nobody could figure out what it's there for. But they realized it must be pretty special because it's in all hair follicles. And it was this man, which we're all familiar with in the CARF community. This is Dr. George Cotzerellis. Uh, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Cotzarellis made some revolutionary findings in about 1990, which changed the world of hair follicle biology and science forever. And what Dr. Cotzarellis discovered was that this bulge region of the hair follicle is where the stem cells live. And this was a revolutionary finding, which has taken us great leaps and bounds ahead in, in the field. These little yellow dots are the stem cells. And if you were to reach out and take with your fingers and pick up one of these little yellow balls, you would have the potential to grow tens of thousands, perhaps more hair shafts, because that's what stem cells are for. They are cells which have the potential to give rise to a lot more uh, hair, hair follicles and hair shafts. And so stem cells are extremely important. They're sort of like seeds and they reside in this region of the hair follicle called the bulge. And what we will find and what we will talk about in the next few minutes is that for some reason, scarring alopecias destroy the stem cells that are located in this bulge region. And so we'll talk more about this. This bulge region is absolutely precious. And in fact, it's so precious that the immune system is told to stay away from this area of the hair follicle and stay away from many areas of the hair follicle. Our immune system is always on patrol. It is patrolling the kidney, the liver, um, the skin. It's, it's, it's like a security guard, I often say, patrolling a big office tower where in the middle of the night it goes room to room, checking doors, seeing if everything's okay. But the immune system is not allowed to patrol the hair follicle. The hair follicle has a privilege of telling the immune system to stay away. Everything's okay. You don't have any business looking in here right now. And that is what we call mm. immune privilege. And so there's tremendous, tremendous research nowadays trying to, trying to understand this concept of immune privilege. Because what has been realized in scarring alopecia is for some reason, this immune privilege breaks down and the immune system is allowed to have access to the hair follicle and you get inflammation in the hair follicle. So these stop signs get taken away and that leads to all sorts of problems. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. So we've talked about the hair shaft, we've talked about the sebaceous glands, we've talked about the bulge, we've talked about immune privilege. 
The final term that I'd like you to, to know about is the oil glands, which uh, are known as the sebaceous glands. And the sebaceous glands produce an oily, goopy substance, and this lubricates the hair follicle as it comes out of the skin. It has antibacterial property, it has antioxidant properties, and the sebaceous gland oil substance is very, very important to keep hair follicles functioning optimally and, and keep them in a very healthy state. And so with these key words, you can describe an enormous amount of um, the understanding that we have in the current year about scarring alopecia because what we understand now is that scarring alopecia is all about the loss of stem cells and the loss of sebaceous glands. And there's inflammation that develops in the area around the sebaceous gland and the stem cells that we'll see in a minute. And this is what ultimately destroys the stem cells of the hair follicle. And so these five terms, these five words, are extremely important in our vocabulary to understand scarring alopecia. So with that, we will delve even further and we'll take a look at, at some of the uh, other fundamentals about the causes of, of scarring alopecia. Hey Jeff, I just yeah. want to say real quick, your analogies are fantastic. I think it's really, really beneficial the way you're putting this into comparisons, real life comparisons to understand what's going on. So um, keep going, it's phenomenal, thank you. Great, great, thanks. Uh, thanks Jean for that, I hope that uh, these are helpful to the listeners as well because, you know, a lot of these concepts at first glance are, are kind of challenging. You hear someone talking about immune privilege and it sounds like, yeah. you know, that just sounds such a bizarre term. We don't talk over the dinner table about immune privilege. So what yeah. is it? Yeah. But when you use right. some analogies, right. you can get a bit of a grasp about it. Yeah, so are there great. any common findings about scarring alopecias that point to a cause? Is there anything else we can learn in the current day and age about what causes these conditions? Well, I'd like to review a couple of the fundamental things about um, some of the earliest findings under the microscope, which in fact did point to some very, very important clues. And the first clue was that most scarring alopecias have inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle. And these little black dots represent inflammatory cells. Um, and the inflammation is not at the bottom. It's not at the very top. It's not way to the left of this diagram. It's not way to the right. It's right there, two thirds of the way up the hair follicle. And interestingly, it's right overlapping the yellow dots, which are the stem cells. And in fact, we think this is not just a coincidence, but that this inflammation actually destroys the hair follicle stem cells. And so we think that this inflammation gets there because immune privilege is lost. Or in other words, the inflammation gets access to the hair follicle, the immune system gets access to the hair follicle because something takes away these stop signs and the immune system is finally allowed to patrol the hair follicle when normally it's told to stay away. And this inflammation destroys the stem cells. And so all scarring alopecias are associated with loss and destruction of stem cells. So whether you're talking about CCCA or central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia or lichen plano pilaris or pseudopalot of Brock, these are all associated with destruction of stem cells. And what destruction of stem cells uh, equates to is a patient not being able to regrow their hair completely. And so what we're trying to do in the current day and age is stop this process so that we don't lose any more stem cells, so we don't lose any more hair. But oftentimes it can be challenging to get the hair to grow back in these scarring alopecias. The second clue was that these scarring alopecias are often associated with some degree of loss, sometimes significant loss, of the oil glands. And so 
The diagram on the right hand side is a more precise version of what we see in scarring alopecia compared to the version on the left. And so in the right, I've taken away the oil gland because the oil glands start disappearing in scarring alopecias. And um, I've taken away the yellow dots because these stem cells are uh, reduced and depleted as well. And so this is a much more accurate representation of what's happening. But is the loss of the sebaceous glands really that important or is it just something that we see and maybe it's a coincidence? Well, it is important, but I don't have to convince you because Dr. Kurt Sten, who's well known to the CARF community, did some pioneering work to convince us all that the oil glands are really important. And a number of years ago, uh, Dr. Sten used some fascinating mouse models. One is called the Isebia mouse. And these are mice that produce an abnormal oil. And what Dr. Sten found in these mice that had these abnormal sebaceous glands was that hair follicles don't behave normally. And in fact, what ends up happening is these mice develop a scarring alopecia. And so are the oil glands really that important? They absolutely are. And in fact, when you look at these uh, mice and their hair follicles, Dr. Sten's acebia mice, instead of the hair follicles growing north out of the skin like we expect hair follicles to grow, they went south deeper and deeper into the skin and in fact they bust open and they created all sorts of inflammation and they created a scarring alopecia. And so it became very, very clear that sebaceous glands are tremendously, tremendously important. And they're not only important in mice, but they're very important in humans as well. And a key feature of these scarring alopecias is a reduction in sebaceous glands. And so if I have a histology slide and I look under the microscope, <coughs> if within a matter of a few seconds, I see, wow, the sebaceous glands are gone. I know within seconds that we're probably dealing with some sort of a scarring alopecia. It's that profound. The loss of the sebaceous glands is a really, really fundamental feature of many of these scarring alopecias. In some, like lichen plano pilaris, the, scar the sebaceous glands are lost very early in the disease. In some others, like CCCA or central centrifugal alopecia, they may be lost a little bit later, but the sebaceous glands play a very, very important role. And so how does all this happen? We know that scarring alopecias are about inflammation, loss of the sebaceous gland, loss of the stem cells. But what triggers all this? Why does this happen in the first place? Of course, we don't know all the answers, but we know some of the answers in some of these uh, hair loss conditions. And one of the first hair loss conditions that's been studied um, to quite a bit of detail is lichen plano pilaris or LPP. And this type of incredible work has been done in the last 10, 11, 12 years. And so in the history of uh, the bigger picture, it's relatively recent that we've uncovered some of these, these key steps. But this work that I'm describing now dates back to about 2008, 2009, where Dr. Karnick and Dr. Mir Marani at Case Western University in the US uh, performed some really fundamental work in lichen plano pilaris. They compared biopsy samples from patients with lichen plano pilaris compared to patients that don't have lichen plano pilaris. And what they were able to show was that one of the earliest steps was that the genes for lipid metabolism, or how fats are processed, are downregulated. There's many, many changes that are observed, some up, some down, but for some reason, the genes for lipid metabolism, especially this pathway called PPAR gamma, was downregulated significantly, some 27-fold. And what they showed that likely uh, contributes 
is that by reducing the levels of PPAR gamma inside the hair follicles, that the hair follicle produces toxic pro-inflammatory lipids. And these toxic pro-inflammatory lipids are thought to be what ends up causing uh, the inflammation, the loss of the sebaceous glands, and the loss of the stem cells. So for some reason in lichen plano pilaris, this PPAR gamma pathway is, is, is told to be quiet, and the, the hair follicle starts making these abnormal fats. Of course, we don't quite understand why this is, but it's thought to be a very, very important pathway. And just like Dr. Sten had some very useful mouse models, uh, Dr. Karnick had some very useful mouse models as well. And uh, her lab had a mouse model where at any instant you wanted, you could, you could have the mouse shut off PPAR gamma signaling inside of the mouse and in the hair follicles. And what was discovered when PPAR gamma was shut off was that the mouse developed scarring alopecia. And that's what's shown here way on the left is that there's these little patches of hair loss. And when these were biopsied, it showed scarring alopecia. But what's even more fascinating is it didn't show just any type of scarring alopecia. It showed a scarring alopecia that very closely resembled lichen plano pilaris. And so here we have a, a model that seems to suggest that this PPAR gamma pathway is really relevant in lichen plano pilaris. It creates these toxic lipids which end up causing problems for the hair follicle. Now, we don't quite understand why this occurs. Why would the cell and the hair follicles stop producing PPAR gamma signaling? And so the race is on to try to understand what are the triggers of all this. And when scientists try to understand triggers, we often talk about maybe genetics is a trigger and maybe something in the environment is a trigger. And so for many diseases of humans, we talk about environmental triggers and genetic triggers. For lichen plano pilaris, we can't really find yet any uh, significant environmental triggers that are consistently present and any genetic triggers that are consistently present. Um, there are some family members with lichen plano pilaris. There are uh, sisters that have lichen plano pilaris. So we know that for some people, genetics may play a role. But for many people with lichen plano pilaris, and for many listeners, um, they will say, you know, I have lichen plano pilaris, but no one in my family has lichen plano pilaris. And that's correct, because we're not sure what role genetics plays quite yet. And as far as environmental triggers, again, we don't know what is out there in the world that may be triggering this to develop. And so clearly more research is needed. And so when we think about this family of scarring alopecias, the, the, the FFA, frontal fibrosing alopecia, CCCA, folliculitis decalvans, and dissecting cellulitis, discoid lupus, you name it, do these have something to do with PPAR gamma as well, or do they have something to do with something else? Well, we don't know. But we do know that they all seem to have something to do with loss of stem cells, and perhaps loss of this immune system control. In LPP, shown on the left, we've talked about this PPAR gamma story, and this may be relevant to FFA as well. But in the last year, we've come to understand a lot more about frontal fibrosing alopecia, and this is a condition that often causes hair loss along the frontal hairline in women. And there have been four genes that have been discovered that if you have these genes, you have an increased risk of developing FFA. And this was some remarkable work from the UK. One of these genes, HLA6, uh, HLA um, was a gene that carried about a four to five fold increased risk of developing FFA. And so the uh, future studies will, will sort of come to understand, you know, what are these four genes all about and, and how can we make use of this information to better understand FFA? 
And so there may be more of a genetic role than we appreciated in the past. For CCCA, we've, we've appreciated a genetic role for quite a while. Um, there is a group of women in South Africa that uh, seem to pass CCCA down in the family in a very clear manner. Uh, we call that an autosomal dominant transmission, but CCCA is one of the hair loss scarring alopecias that does seem to have a fairly strong genetic role. Uh, and there has been some new genes that have been discovered. One is called PADI3. And there's also been some interesting work showing that genes that control scarring uh, seem to play a role in, in CCCA. And there seems to be a pretty tight link between the chances of developing CCCA and the chances of developing uterine fibroids, another type of scarring condition. And so this is some really fascinating work done in the U.S. and uh, more research will shed light on, on the relevance of this and, and, and what we can do with this information. And in folliculitis decalvans, um, it's thought that bacteria play a role, especially staphylococci play a role in folliculitis decalvans. And there, there may be some mechanisms that cause these bacteria to adhere and glue to the scalp in patients with folliculitis decalvans, and so there's a lot of active research in that area. But tremendous progress in all of these scarring alopecias, which, which brings hope that uh, more answers lie ahead. But of course, one question that we need to answer is, why do these conditions affect certain areas of the scalp and not others? After all, these are hair follicles, and if the immune system is going to get access to the hair follicle, why, why are some areas more predisposed than others? Why is lichen planopilaris more likely to affect the, the middle of the scalp, although it can affect many areas of the scalp? Why does FFA have a predilection for the front? Why does CCCA uh, often affect the middle of the scalp? And why does folliculitis decalvans affect the crown? These we don't know, but uh, someday we, we will. And so the next era is really about understanding more about these pathways and more about understanding what are the triggers that, that cause these conditions and what role does genetics have? Does it have more of a role in some of these conditions than we have appreciated? Certainly does for CCCA, may for FFA, but there's a lot more work that, that needs to be done. And with these powerful, powerful techniques of genomics and proteomics and lipidomics, there is massive amounts of information coming out um, that requires computers to actually analyze. But uh, this will push this field forward in great leaps and bounds. So it's a really exciting time. So in conclusion, you have these five terms now at your disposal, and these five terms are really important because scarring alopecias are about the loss of these stem cells, which leads to a, 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 an inability of hair follicles to regenerate themselves. And these powerful techniques will, will help drive this field forward. And finally, I want to thank uh, the people from CARF, and, and thank you, Jean, for this invitation. I really am. So happy to be able to, to chat today and to speak with all the members about uh, this very important subject and the, the great strides that have been made. Uh, and thanks to Colleen for all her assistance and, and Michael for uh, helping produce these webinars. And this will be a, a really fantastic resource for everyone. And I'm, I'm so glad that they'll stay up on the web for, for a while to come and, uh, and hopefully people can refer to these. So, so thank you. And thank you also to the, the CARF Board of Directors. And with that, I thank will you. conclude uh, part one, and uh, thank you again. Uh, Jeff, this was absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I've heard this, I've learned, I've been with the organization now for almost three years, and you know, I always learn something when I'm listening to these webinars, something new, because there's just so much that's going on in the world of, of science and, and discovery. And um, you know, your presentation really brought it to a place where it's very clear and understandable in very layman's terms. So I sincerely appreciate that on behalf of our members. Thank you. So, I'm so um, glad. Now, yeah, yeah, it's really great. So now what we're going to do is um, we're going to open it up to some questions. I know that we have some that are waiting in the queue. 
Um, and so I'm going to ask it. I know you can't see these, but our audience can. Um, so one of the first questions is, does hair dyeing and coloring make my LPP worse? So we really don't have any good evidence that hair dyeing makes LPP worse, at least right now. Um, hair dye allergy is something that I always think about with anyone who has itching and burning and redness in the scalp. And so do I see patients with lichen plano pilaris that have a hair dye allergy? Yes, but it's certainly not common. And so we have to sometimes have it in the back of our mind if, if someone is being treated for their lichen plano pilaris and um, they're on many treatments and for some reason uh, they're not getting better and the redness isn't going away and uh, they're tremendously itchy still and we've tried everything, we have to at least consider it. But it, it okay. is, Gene, a very rare phenomenon in most patients, and I encourage many of my own patients to continue on with hair dyeing uh, without a worry that they're causing some sort of exacerbation of their lichen plano bilaris. Well, that's, that's good news. That's good to hear. Um, so we're going to move on now to our second question. So if I had a scalp biopsy five or so years ago, and it was determined that I had scarring alopecia, but I don't have the typical signs or symptoms except for hair loss. Should I have a repeat biopsy? This is such a great question. And <laughs> I think one of the key principles is if something doesn't make sense, it makes sense to do another biopsy. Now, there's a difference between it doesn't make sense to one person, but it makes sense to another person. So if it makes sense to the doctor, uh, the dermatologist, let's say, who's examining the scalp, then perhaps a biopsy is not needed. But whenever something doesn't quite make sense and, and it doesn't add up, then, then a biopsy is often very, very valuable. Um, biopsies are not foolproof. They're not 100%. And that comes as a surprise to many people. Um, certainly every week I see patients that come in the door with biopsies that say lichen plano pilaris and they don't have lichen plano pilaris. Um, now, that's not common, but we need to at least consider that uh, if something doesn't add up and a patient doesn't have, you know, hair shedding of some sort and they don't really have anything in terms of itching and burning and they, they don't have a red scalp um, and it's not affecting at least some hair follicles in the middle of the scalp, then perhaps one has to at least consider the possibility that there could be an error somewhere. Um, the chances are low. But I think the question is really a great one. And if something doesn't add up, a repeat biopsy can be tremendously, tremendously helpful. So I just had a question that popped up when you were providing that answer. So how did that person come to your office with a diagnosis of LPP when, they, when you saw that they don't have it? Like, why did that happen? Did somebody diagnose them from a visual? They were biopsied. Many of these patients are, are diagnosed by biopsy. The, the error often comes with um, an examination of the biopsy and a realization that there's scarring seen in the scalp biopsy, which we call fibrosis. And there's inflammation present in the upper part of the hair follicle. And a pathologist will say, if you're thinking about LPP, I see uh, inflammation and I see fibrosis, so maybe it is like in Plano pilaris. In androgenetic alopecia or female pattern hair loss, we see fibrosis and we see inflammation in the upper part of the hair follicle. And so if one isn't careful, we can make uh, an erroneous diagnosis of lichen plano pilaris. The tip-off for these cases is often what's happening to the sebaceous glands. If the sebaceous glands are there, and there's tons of them, the patient may not have lichen plano pilaris. But if the biopsy report shows the sebaceous glands are destroyed, they're not there, or they're reduced, and this is pretty good evidence that we're probably dealing with a scarring alopecia. So many of these patients, Gene, that come in with these 
biopsy results of lichen plano pilaris, the thing that I look for is the comment mm -hmm. on the spacious glands. And of course, the pattern of inflammation as well. But um, this is where sometimes the biopsies go wrong. Okay, well, that's really good information. I think that's really great for our members, too, to, to be you know, aware of the sebaceous glands and the, the activity and the um, significance of them in, in your scoring alopecia diagnosis. That's great. So we're going to do another question now. Um, we can ask questions for about another 20 to 25 minutes. So if you have um, a question that you'd like to ask, um, I, I can't guarantee that we're going to get to all of them, um, but certainly those who have submitted questions earlier today and last night, um, but if you have some, you can post them in under, um, right underneath in Facebook, um, in the box underneath the video, and you can also do them on YouTube. So just FYI, but we're going to try to get to as many as we can. So our next one here um, is, hello, I am a 56-year-old healthy female, but I have a terrible problem with scarring alopecia. Are there any new developments as far as being able to regrow hair or at least transplant hair to a scarred over area? Another really, really great question. And, you know, 10 years ago, we would say that we don't grow back hair in scarring alopecia, that once the hair follicle has been lost, um, it's been lost for good. And what we're trying to do is prevent it from getting worse. But what we know now is that, in fact, some patients with scarring alopecia do get some improvement. And some get a bit of improvement, some get more than a bit, but the rules that it never improves are no longer what we believe. And we see that most clearly in frontal fibrosing alopecia, where now with the use of medications like finasteride and dutasteride, we're actually seeing some improvement in some patients, not all, but in some patients. And so this is challenging that old theory that we don't get any improvement. But certainly in other scarring alopecias, if the disease is caught in the early stages, when inflammation is present under the scalp, but this inflammation hasn't yet caused permanent hair loss, we can sometimes get improvement to some degree by chasing away that inflammation with various treatments. And so some patients can get some improvement, but the remarkable improvements that uh, we all hope for um, are still going to be some years away until we find out treatments that really target some of these pathways which, with more precision. Mm -hmm. As far as hair transplants goes, that is a subject which is so important, and I'm glad that we'll cover it because... Um, I think hair transplants are something that need to be done very, very, very carefully. Uh, and in order for a patient to have a green light to go ahead and have a hair transplant, the disease must be completely quiet for generally about two years. There is some debate among specialists whether it's one year or two years, but my feeling is that it has to be quiet for a very, very long time. And by quiet, I mean there's no itching, there's no burning, there's no redness. And when you take a picture of the scalp and you compare that same picture two years later, if that picture looks exactly the same with no hair loss happening over that two-year interval, then the patient may be a candidate to go ahead and have a surgery in some cases. Now, generally mm -hmm. speaking, that patient should be off medications because that tells us that the disease is truly inactive or burnt out, as we sometimes say. But hair transplants can be successful in some patients, but not in all patients. And one of the reasons why they're often unsuccessful is the patient's disease truly isn't burnt out. It's not truly inactive yet. And so mm -hmm. hair transplants can work in some patients, but I think it's a, a, a process that needs a lot of really careful consideration, Jean. Okay, all right, that's great. So um, I just wanna let you know that you are a very popular guy tonight and we have a ton of questions that are coming in. So I think maybe what we'll do is we'll do more of like a rapid fire kind of questions so that um, we can get as many as possible. 
Um, okay, so we're going to go kind of fast. First, is there a link between Hashimoto's disease and either FFA or LPP? There sure is. Uh, patients with FFA have about a nine times higher risk of having thyroid disease compared to patients that don't have FFA. Uh, and in LPP, there's a, a markedly increased risk of thyroid disease as well compared to patients that don't. And about a third of patients have some sort of thyroid dysfunction. And so it absolutely has increased. Okay. Next one. If you relapse after a period of control, is LPP worse or more difficult to go back into remission? Scarring alopecias are unpredictable, and that's a really important word. But generally speaking, if we have shown that the immune system can be controlled to some degree and the disease activity brought lower, then that is often a state that we can return to in the future if it happens to uh, increase in its, in its activity with a flare at some point. And so if a patient flares, there's a very good chance that we can get the immune system under control again because we've demonstrated it once. And so I'm usually pretty hopeful in these situations. Okay, great. Can you have both FFA and LPP? You sure can. And about 25% of patients with frontal fibrosing alopecia have lichen plano pilaris further back in the scalp as well. And so these conditions are very, very closely related and you can certainly have both and many patients do. Okay. For LPP, what triggers the scalp soreness or slight burning? Is it triggered by the sun, heat, or a hard workout? Or is this sensitivity to the tonic and medicated shampoo that I'm using? It can be all of the above. Uh, patients with LPP can get soreness uh, because of the sun, because of stress, because of medicated shampoos, because of alcohols in topical corticosteroids, from the disease itself, um, from those little black dots that you saw in the diagram, that's inflammation. It's a whole host of reasons that give uh, rise to the, to the symptoms, and sometimes it requires a bit of detective work to figure out, is it one, is it two, is it three, is it four? What's causing this? Okay. Are laser devices useful for itching, shedding, or regrowth? The uh, use of lasers in uh, scarring alopecia is newer, but there are some studies showing that it can reduce inflammation and, and disease activity in some patients. Maybe 25 or 30% of patients will feel that these devices are doing something. Uh, and so the answer is they, they may have a use. Um, many patients with scarring alopecia also have genetic hair loss or female pattern hair loss or male balding, and these lasers can also help those conditions as well. And so they are important considerations for many patients as well. Okay. I have suffered with LPP for years and nothing seems to be helping and I've had, bald, I've had a bald spot the size of a baseball. I get monthly injections and take biotin supplements, apply minoxidil, clobetazole, and recently took Plaquenil, but nothing is working. What next? I am very desperate. So I think in a situation like this, of course, one needs to know all the facts, and that's one thing I reiterate many, many times. But I think the key question is, is that size of the baseball increasing over time, or is it staying the same? Um, because what we are expecting is that scarred patch on the scalp to stay the same size. We don't expect it, unfortunately, to grow hair. Uh, and so it's important to know what the expectations are in this situation. Um, but in instances where the area is getting bigger over time and a camera is capturing that and it's being documented, um, there are other treatments that can be considered to tell the immune system to settle down. And there's a list of, of immunosuppressing medications that, that's about 10 or 15 long. Um, it doesn't mean in every patient we go to those, but there are other medications in scarring alopecia of this kind like methotrexate, cyclosporin, um, I'm not sure if tacrolimus was mentioned, but tofacitinib, topical tofacitinib, uh, mycophenolate. So there's a whole host of medications that can also be considered. 
but really it comes down to what's happening to that baseball sized patch. Is it actually staying the same or is it getting worse? And if it's getting bigger, then I'm more likely to think about those, those other options. But if it's staying the same, my options may be uh, slightly different and we're just trying to uh, keep it the same size. Okay. Okay. Um, our la oh, wait, we just had this one. Are layers or devices useful for itching and shedding or regrowth? We need another one. They're going to come up on the screen shortly. Hopefully. <laughs> what is the impact of taking Zyrtec on pain and itching as well as progressive hair loss? What is the appropriate dose? So Zyrtec is an antihistamine. Its uh, formal name is cetirizine, and it's a common antihistamine that people use for allergies and allergy season. Um, and what we've come to understand is these histamine pathways play a really important role in itching and play a really important role in the itching that occurs in scarring alopecia, particularly like in plano pilaris. Uh, and so it may have a role in how we treat these scarring alopecias as well. Uh, and so cetirizine at a dose of 10 milligrams and sometimes 20 and higher uh, can be used in some patients to control the itching and the scalp symptoms that patients have. And there's been uh, at least one study uh, from a few years back which showed that uh, uh, cetirizine or Zyrtec can actually be helpful for some patients to reduce disease activity. Um, these are fairly uh, safe medications for most. They, of course, can cause drowsiness in a small subset, even though they're not supposed to be all that sedating. Uh, and they do have some other side effects as well, uh, uncommonly, but uh, these certainly are options for people with uh, stubborn itching and burning uh, with scarring alopecia. Okay, good to know. So our next question is, has spironolactone been proven to be generally effective for scarring alopecia such as CCCA? So spironolactone is a tablet um, that is an, a group of tablets called antiandrogens. So they block the male type hormones. Spironolactone is commonly used in female genetic hair loss or what we call female pattern hair loss. Um, but it's less uh, commonly used in the scarring alopecias of CCCA. Now, if someone has CCCA scarring alopecia and also has female pattern hair loss, it certainly may be a good option. Um, there may be a closer link between female genetic hair loss and CCCA than we ever appreciated before. Uh, this is some important work that the Cleveland Clinic in the United States has done. Uh, and some other investigators. But generally speaking, uh, spironolactone has more of a role in female pattern genetic hair loss than CCCA. And with CCCA alone, I would consider other treatments to suppress the immune system and suppress inflammation um, as opposed to anti-androgens. Okay, okay. So having FFA, I have been on dutasteride for two years. When I started my dehydrotestosterone was elevated, but now it's almost non-existent. Should I go off dutasteride? It has helped slow down hair loss. It's such a great question. And um, the answer to that really requires a lot more investigation and, and, and discussion than a yes or no, and, and this is often the case. But um, DHT levels are quite unreliable and unpredictable, and you can get DHT measured on Monday, and it'll be different than Tuesday, and it'll be yet different than on Wednesday. And so DHT levels do fluctuate. But in this particular situation, probably the drug is, is affecting the DHT levels. Um, I think what's more important in a situation like this is what are the testosterone levels and what are the other androgen levels and what are the estrogen levels? Um, and is this medication affecting uh, more hormonal type um, patterns than, than just the DHT? If a patient is feeling pretty good, uh, meaning there's no mood changes, no breast tenderness, no changes in libido, um, 
then it may be reasonable in many cases to consider uh, continuing a medication like dutasteride despite these subtle changes or profound changes in some cases uh, of DHT levels. But of course, this does require a case-by-case -case sort of discussion, but it really more comes down to what's happening with the other hormone tests and what's happening to the patient. Does the patient feel good? And if it's helping the disease and the patient feels good, more times than not, we're more likely to continue the medication than be swayed by a DHT reading. Gotcha. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, here's a one. Do plant-based diets work for FFA and LPP? So it's such a terrific question. <laughs> and um, I, can, I can tell you many patients will say a resounding yes. And many patients right now, if they're listening, are saying, Dr. Donovan, tell us once and for all, yes. And um, <laughs> I do think that one of the optimal diets for you know, antioxidants um, and anti-inflammatory contributions um, can come certainly from a plant-based diet. It's not the only one, but a plant-based diet certainly um, is uh, very anti-inflammatory and can support uh, many of these aspects that we think are going awry in, in these immune-based diseases. What we would ideally like is some really good studies to back it up so that I can take a paper or some sort of manuscript and say, here's the evidence uh, you know, that, that backs mm -hmm. this up. But the start of anything is anecdotal evidence. And I certainly have patients that have been on certain diets, like plant-based diets, and have had remarkable changes in, um, in their disease. And so I think it's an important area to study. Um, there's about 485 diets out there. And so it's challenging mm -hmm. research, but it's important research. And uh, personally, I think it's the way of the future in understanding many of these conditions uh, with the immune system. And so the, the final word is stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Until that paper or that manuscript comes out, I think this will definitely be something up for debate for years. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we have a few more we can get to. Um, is scarring alopecia connected with other autoimmune diseases like diabetes? Scarring alopecia certainly can be connected to other autoimmune diseases. Diabetes is not usually one that is typically seen with all that uh, much significance. Certainly autoimmune thyroid disease is one of the more common autoimmune diseases that is seen in both lichen plano pilaris and uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia as one of the questions alluded to. Um, but what we're learning is that there may be other autoimmune diseases that we sometimes see um, in uh, some of these autoimmune diseases. They're not common, but we have to have our radar uh, out. And if a person has one autoimmune disease, we know that their chances of developing a second autoimmune disease are slightly increased. And so... When I speak with a patient with uh, scarring alopecia, I, I often will uh, go head to toe and think about, um, is it possible that you have uh, any autoimmune disease in the eyeball, in the uh, you know, lungs, in the liver, in the joints, um, in other parts of the body? So we at least have to think about it. And uh, some very simple screening questions can, uh, can get those kind of answers. But uh, autoimmune thyroid disease is by far the most common. Okay. All right. Well, I think we have one time for one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. We're approaching um, Eastern time, the 9 o'clock hour. So are there environmental factors that exacerbate this disease? I have had flare-ups since I moved to a large city about four years ago. Many patients will share the same uh, story, and the environmental factors are not yet really, really worked out. Although certainly for some people, heat and humidity can make scarring alopecia feel worse. They can exacerbate itching. Um, 
the role of other things like pollution, I think, is going to get a lot of attention over the next uh, many years because it's an area that's often neglected in, in um, certainly skin immunology, um, but ultraviolet radiation as well, and um, certainly um, exposure to ultraviolet radiation, and especially burns, can exacerbate scarring alopecia symptoms in, in some patients. Um, if you consider stress an environmental factor, then, then that certainly is another one um, that definitely has a role in scarring alopecia. Um, again, not, not really uh, backed up by great, great randomized uh, clinical trials, but um, there are environmental factors that play roles in scarring alopecia. There's no doubt about it. Uh, I think we're still a, a couple years away from really understanding what these factors do to the immune system. Um, but uh, that information is, is on the way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that is going to end our, uh, our time with you. Um, I just can't even begin to tell you how wonderful this was to have you join us tonight. I know a lot of people had uh, their questions answered. I think you have been extremely informative. Um, we're, we're thrilled that we can have you, and thank you so much, Dr. Donovan. I, I think it was to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. It was my pleasure. Okay. Stay well and be healthy, and um, we'll be in touch with you again soon. Sounds okay, good. Okay, so we'll now I'm just going to... Okay, see you later. I'm just going to wrap up um, tonight's presentation and say thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, this presentation will be available on our website. It'll be sent out via email through an e-blast and also through our social media channels. So if you happen to join late or you want you missed a question or you, you know you want to go back and hear it again, um, this will totally be available for you on our website. Um, also want to let you know that we have our next upcoming webinar. We're doing these once a month, um, at least for this this year, 2020. Um, so the next one's going to be on May 12th, and it's going to be a subject matter of the mind and body connection, which I'm sure we can all use right now, especially in these trying times. It's going to be really helpful to learn a little bit about how our mind affects our body and how that's all connected. Um, so mark your calendars. It's May 12th. It's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will be sending more information out about that, and so you should be getting it through your email. And for those of you who um, you know, are, know other people that are not really engaged with CARF and they're not getting our communications, please share our information with them and, and have them get back in touch with us. We'd love to add them to our, our list, um, and we also love to be able to start sharing great information with them and that can help improve their life or um, you know, their journey with this, this scarring alopecia. Uh, so I'm going to wrap it up for tonight and just say everybody stay healthy, stay well. Um, stay in touch with us. We're around. Um, we'll be posting a lot more information through our social media, and um, we're good to go. So uh, thank you again. Have a great evening, and I'll be back in touch with you guys again soon. See ya.